We don't often talk about this component of Singapore math because it looks rather theoretical and academic to many people, but it is arguably the most important feature of the curriculum. Hi, I'm Wensi, and welcome to episode five of my mini series on Singapore math. I'm an expert on Singapore math because I grew up in Singapore. I went through 12 full years of Singapore's math education and lived to tell the tale. And now I'm getting my PhD in math education in the US. Today, I'm going to break down this Pentagon for you and show you how Singapore used it to train an entire generation of children who rank number one in math globally. Singapore's math curriculum framework is frequently overlooked in the discussion of Singapore math. We like to talk more about the CPA approach or the bar models because these are more glamorous and buzzworthy. But for a curriculum to be Singapore math, it needs to be built on this framework. This Pentagon is a rather latecomer to Singapore's math curriculum. In my previous videos, I talked about how the CPA approach was added to the curriculum in 1981 and bar modeling in 1983. The curriculum framework was only established in 1988, but it's still very much in use now, with the exception of some minor revisions. This framework represents the overarching philosophy of Singapore's math curriculum. It guides teachers on how to structure their lessons and education experts on how to revise the curriculum. At the center of this pentagon is mathematical problem solving. Everything else revolves around the main goal of developing students into problem solvers. The five supporting components in the framework are concepts, skills, processes, metacognition, and attitudes. Let's first take a look at concepts. We already know how much Singapore values conceptual understanding. Everything we've looked at so far, the spiral curriculum design, the CPA approach, and bar modeling are all meant to help children develop conceptual understanding. Singapore values the ability to calculate as much as conceptual understanding, which brings us to the next component, skills. Skills are pretty much what most of us associate with mathematics, like how to add fractions or how to multiply two-digit numbers. The third component in the framework is processes, which refers to how we think through problems and communicate those thoughts. Singapore uses the problem-solving framework devised by the Hungarian-American mathematician, George Polya. In Polya's framework, we first have to understand the problem, then we devise the plan, next we carry out the plan, and finally we check our answer. This framework may look simple, but it's an easier said than done situation. The other thing that Singapore emphasizes on in this component is communication. It's important to have children communicate verbally about how they think through problems, but it's equally important that children are able to communicate mathematically on paper. Communicating mathematically isn't about getting to the right solution. It's about being able to translate the problem into appropriate equations and present a coherent solution. The fourth component in the framework is metacognition. It's a big word, isn't it? Simply put, metacognition is our ability to monitor our own thinking. This is based on the work of American developmental psychologist John Flowell. Metacognition is crucial in problem solving because it develops children into independent thinkers. When we can keep track of our mental processes, we can methodically devise and carry out a solution plan, check our steps, and justify the reasons behind our strategies without any external prompt. Last but not least, we have attitudes as the fifth component. When I was in school in Singapore, my teachers made it very clear that we can all improve on our math skills if we put in the time and effort and persevered. They would not accept the excuse of, I'm just not a math person, so we just all had to try hard. What we didn't know at the time was that our teachers were actually cultivating a growth mindset, which is the belief that abilities can be developed through dedication and effort. Singapore officially integrated growth mindset principles into its national math curriculum in 2001, years before the concept went mainstream in the US. Growth mindset only really gained major traction globally after Dr. Carol Dweck published her influential book Mindset in 2006. Dr. Joe Bowler's book, Mathematical Mindsets, published in 2015, sparked the movement to integrate growth mindset in math education. I highly recommend checking out these books to learn more about the impacts of mindsets. So I've included links to both in the description below. If we look at the timeline closely, we would realize that Singapore started to cultivate a growth mindset in their students almost two decades before the US. That means Singaporean students have a 20 year head start in establishing the right mindset in math when compared to American students. 
It's not enough to just focus on conceptual understanding and procedural skills. As we've seen today, the reason why Singapore's math curriculum is so successful is because it has integrated so many key competencies. Students who have gone through a Singapore math curriculum should not only be able to explain concepts and calculate accurately, they also need to be able to tackle any non-routine problems that come their way and monitor their own thinking. In short, these students are taught to think like mathematicians. If you want to learn more about Singapore math, you can purchase my book through the link in the description. We have one final episode in this mini-series on Singapore math that we'll be dropping at the same time on Wednesday next week. We're going to be talking about what students are actually being tested on in international assessments like TIMS and PISA, and why Singapore is always number one. Don't miss out and stay tuned by hitting the subscribe button.